Welcome in. It is Big Ten today on a Tuesday. Dave Rebson, Dave Wanstead. I missed you last week. I it know. was fun to do hoops. Well, we had a great time in Minneapolis, but I needed my Wani fans. I, I, and I'm into hoops. I'm a hoops fan. Yes. So I, I watch I watched you all the time. Yeah. No, you know what? It, um, it's that time of year. That tells you that we are getting past the halfway mark. Yes. And now we start zeroing in. Obviously, who can close out the season? Uh, bowl games become a topic now. Playoffs become a topic now. This is the time of year. Basketball is kind of my alert. <laughs> Wait a minute. This is happening. Uh, let's start with the first part of that. Uh, who can close out the season? Because that, in essence, is our big story today. We're looking at these divisional races. You've got one side that's wide open, another that has a little more clarity. We know about the big three in the East. It's likely going to come down to their round robin barring an upset elsewhere. And, of course, the first of those games is Saturday with Penn State and Ohio State. Iowa's in the pole position in the West after beating Wisconsin, so they hold the tiebreaker with the Badgers. Still have four division games left. The only remaining crossover for them is Rutgers. We're going to go, uh, starting with the East, and, and go with, you know, to me, the, the teams that are in the best spot. And, and in the East, obviously, you've got three teams there. Curious what you think it will take for each one of them to be the team that ends up on top. Let's start with Michigan, the highest rated of those teams, and the team that faces its challenges the latest in the season. Really, November will determine it for them. They, they do. F from a uh, talent football standpoint, yes. Penn State, Ohio State, we know all about them. We'll get into them. This Michigan team, it reminds me a little bit, when I was at the University of Miami, Rever, for two years we were ranked number one in the country, straight yeah. through the season and the next year. There's a lot of pressure that comes with that. Michigan's been playoff team, right. top team. How are they going to hold on to it? To me, it's not about really the X and O's as much and the talent as much of, of them running the table. To me, it's the off the field stuff. And by that, I mean, think about it. Uh, we always talk about distractions. Uh, this week, Michigan State, right, going on the road. Yeah. Crazy things happen. Who's the better team? Blocking, tackling? No question. Michigan is. Yes. But when you go into an emotional game like that in state, you got to get ready. How about the head coach, Jim Harbaugh, being suspended for the first few games? That could have been a distraction that all of a sudden you go out and you stub your toe, you lose a game. Was that because the other team was a better football team? No. It was all about the off the field mental approach. So when I, when I look at this Michigan team, I say I'm, I'm not concerned where they're at. I, they're making progress from a football standpoint week after. They've had a little bit of adversity. I mean, uh, and it's all good. I mean, they fall behind Rutgers, right? They, they it's a touchdown. They fall behind last week, a touchdown, and they overcome it. Their first two drives last week, three and out, three and out. So the coaches are doing a good job of regrouping the players. Uh, the coaches are doing a good job of making any adjustments that might need to be made. So I, I think they're, they're right where they need to be now as long as they keep that psychological warfare in their minds right week after week. Let me ask you about this because it feels to me, and again, we only see what we see, right? right. I mean, we only see game day, yep. essentially. You see a little bit in terms of media interaction during the course of the week. And that's it, and uh, understandably. But it seems to me that that which they let us see, particularly when they're playing the games on Saturday, that this team is having a great time. They don't seem to feel pressure, or if they are feeling pressure, they're not showing it externally. I think you can make the argument they didn't play great those first few games when Jim wasn't there. The Bowling Green game is probably the one that stands out with the turnover issues, particularly right. with J.J. McCarthy. But, man, these last few weeks, Coach, I mean, they do not look like a team that's feeling pressure. They may be. They don't look like it. Yeah, no, they they don't. I, I totally agree with you. That's why I said from a football blocking, tackling, catching, uh, passing situation, no. there's. I don't see a problem right now. It's all the mental approach to, you know, do they go in there and, oh, boy, you know, this team lost to Rutgers and this team lost to, you know, and, and, put, and forget about some of the history when they were favored and they right. were going up to East Lansing to play and they got upset. Right. Yeah, no no doubt. Look, the Michigan State game has been an incredible Crazy rivalry touch. through the years. And it's interesting that they have started to articulate here in the last couple of years because, you know, it used to be just kind of focused on beating Ohio State. They have said, especially in light of what happened two years ago, they have said when they 
line line up the the goals for the season beating Michigan State is one of those goals so that that kind of helps you in terms of not overlooking this game you know they always talk about well we're gonna win the Big Ten we're gonna beat Ohio State we're gonna win the national championship now they see beat Michigan State and Ohio State the, the one game that they have on their schedule that Jim's gonna have to be in my opinion careful of and I and it, it was a great win for Illinois, but I really thought that Maryland had it going. Mm -hmm. They play Maryland this year at Maryland between yes. Penn State and yes. Michigan. And yeah. that, if there was such a thing where you put the mouse traps on, it, that could be a trap game for them because Maryland is a lot better football team and explosive football team. You know, it's not three plays in a cloud of dust. You know, a lot of these, you know, I mean, we know what we're going to get out of these other teams. Uh, not Maryland. I mean, you know, they can throw the ball and make big plays. So that's the one game uh, that I look at down the road and say, and it's sandwiched between, obviously, Penn State and Ohio State, which even makes it more so of how many times can you get up yes. emotionally and ready to go. No, I agree. I mean, essentially what you're saying is the three toughest games they play on paper come in succession, three exactly. in a row. And, yep. and that's really difficult. One of those games, of course, is the season ender against Ohio State. We're going to know a lot more about Ohio State when we sit here a week from now, huge game at home against Penn State. Ohio State has been so banged up, and yet I would argue, and I said this yesterday with Nicole and Jerry, and I'll reiterate it here, I think they played their best game of the year against Purdue. So what will Ohio State need to do to be that team, Wani, yeah. that emerges at the end, the expectation that they come in every single year of being that team? You know what? You said we're going to find a lot about Ohio State. I agree. We're going to yeah. find a lot about Cal McCord, the quarterback at Ohio State. To me, you know, this this week is going to be huge from a, a separation of us sitting here next week saying, you know what, wow, he handled it. He continued to play good. He took another step. Uh, or is this Penn State defense this week going to all of a sudden turn this whole thing upside down? So we'll know more about Ohio State. We'll know more about the quarterback. But when I look at their schedule, uh, I, I, I always like those teams as the weather gets colder and you go down. They've got physical football teams. Now with the injury at quarterback at Wisconsin, you know that's going to be a physical game. Rutgers is going to be physical. Michigan State, Minnesota is going to be physical. They're getting better. And then Michigan. So, Ryan Day, the, the whole talk after the first game of, hey, uh, we wanted to be physical with Notre Dame. That was a great game. They were physical. I mean, they went, you know, they, they went punch for punch with Notre Dame, a physical football team. Uh, that's what they're going to need to finish this season out. It's going to come down to that. The defense is playing at a high level. The one area of their team that of their football team that I'd like to see them, you know, they're running for about 130 yards a game. Penn State's around 200. Michigan's about 185. And yep. as you get into the colder weather and the snow and the elements, you got to be able to run that game to close out games, close games. And that's the one area of this Ohio State team that I, I think they just need to keep taking take steps forward. And it's hard, right? I mean, you're down to your fourth running back. And by the way, I mean, Dallin Hayden, if that's your fourth running back. He was impressive. You're in pretty good shape. Yeah. Offensive line, as we know, has not been at the level they had hoped that it would be. Although, again, I think you could argue it probably played – Maybe it's best game yep. against Purdue. So uh, if you can get Travion Henderson back healthy, if you can get Mayan Williams back healthy, maybe you start to build off that line play. But, yes, I mean, this does not seem like there's no team in the Big Ten that has fewer rushes of 10 yards or longer than Ohio State. Like, that's crazy yeah. to think, given, yeah. given the caliber of backs they have. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we talked about McCord, a young quarterback, first time starting in these big games that he, he's never played in before. Uh, C.J. Stroud, okay, he's not C.J. Stroud, a veteran quarterback. So how do you help a quarterback, a young quarterback that's going into to huge football games you know, that are coming up for Ohio State? you got to run the football. I mean, that's the quickest way to take some pressure off this kid and open up the passing game. I mean, if you're running the ball, every team that they got on the schedule here is going to say, stop the run, stop the run. They they have to be a balanced team, in my opinion, if they're going to come out of this thing on top of it. All right, let's dive into Penn State. And again, we'll know a lot more a week from now. These have not typically been the kind of games that they have won. They are 1-20 and 20 against top five opponents this century. So th this is the big challenge, right? Can you beat Ohio State? Can you beat Michigan? They've gotten their program to the cusp of that. 
They gave Ohio State a heck of a game last year. They did not give Michigan a very good game. They have played Ohio State so close under James Franklin, only beaten them once. What yep. will it take for them to be that team that emerges? They don't necessarily have to beat Ohio State, right? I mean, it could be Michigan that you yep. beat. But, hey, this is the opportunity right here in front of you this week. What's it going to take? You, you know, you, you look at this football team, and you knew this. I didn't, okay? I'm, you're, you're always teaching me stuff here. <laughs> Stop it. But, uh, no, I'm, I'm being serious. <laughs> this morning, I sat down with Jacob, okay, our producer. Our producer. That's and, our and steam I was producer. I was taught. Uh, yeah. Oh. Outstanding, and I and I was talking about this Penn State team, and I said, you know, and I remember being at the Penn State Ohio State game when they couldn't make a first down at the end of the game to win it, and I said, you know, this the Penn State running attack, the Penn State running attack, and Jacob said to me, our producer, slowed on, coach. Guess who's leading the Big Ten in rushing? Penn State. I did not realize that. I'll be quite honest with you. I knew that. And in my opinion, between Singleton and uh, uh, Allen, Allen. Allen yep. we haven't seen their best day yet. So right. and, uh, when I look at this team, Manny Diaz is off the chart. He's playing fantastic defense. The quarterback, James Franklin, got him playing lights out. I mean, you know, Allen, I mean, no interceptions. You kidding me? Twelve touchdowns, no interceptions. That is, that's off the chart. The one area that I was a little bit from the past. Oh, how are they going to run the ball when he gets down there? Guess what? They're running the ball, and I don't think we've seen the best of their running game from a big play standpoint. You know what? And I look at this, and again, like they got two special teams touchdowns this week. I mean, this is an imperfect statistic, but they are the highest scoring team in the Big Ten. There you go. So I understand there's hand wringing about we're not busting big plays. And we don't stretch the field. We have a couple capable receivers. We don't do it. Our, our backs, who you mentioned, Sickles and Allen, the, neither one of them has broken a, a long run all season. However, mm. the name of the game is to score points and win games. Yep. And that is exactly what they are doing. Now, can you do it against Ohio State and Michigan without stretching the field, without threatening a, a defense deep? I, I think that's what remains to be seen. But, but man... There is so that. much to like, and as you talk about, I mean, they're, they're not just playing good defense, but they're far and away the best defense in the country in terms of total yards. T top five in the country in scoring offense, yep. top five in the scoring on defense, uh, second in the nation in turnover margin. Boy, that's good coaching. That's players tuned into what you're trying to get done week after week. Uh, th this, this, a month ago, <clears throat> I, I said I thought Penn State was – potentially the best team in the Big Ten, and nothing has happened that made me go the other direction at right. all. In fact, I even feel better about them right now just because the, if, if you're defending them, and I look at everything from, okay, if i got to stop Penn State, i got to stop this running game. I mean, you know, they're going to have some opportunities to throw the ball because they're running it so well, and the defense is going to, you know, the defense is going to flip the field on you with all their tackles for losses and sacks. I mean, this is a, a talented team. It's a well-coached team. Huge, huge weekend for them, yep. no question about it. What about Iowa? So now they are in the driver's seat. You know, so they have the tiebreaker against Wisconsin. They don't really have difficult crossovers left. All due respect to Rutgers. That's their, you know, they don't have to play any of those top three yep. on the other side. They've only had to play Penn State this year. We know how that went. It did not go well. But if they can take care of business within the division – they're likely going to win the division. What do you think it will take for them to do that with all of the issues that they have offensively? You know what? I, I, University of Iowa administration, please, the Pittsburgh Steelers or the Chicago Bears would be happy to win a game 14 to 9, okay, or 10 to 7. So let's move on. Let's just win. You know what I mean? I mean, I, 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 I get so tired of hearing this. I think that might have been as good a coaching job as they had last week in that win over Wisconsin. I mean, their, their, their quarterback situation is it, it's a shame with Cade McNamara. I mean, it, it is, it, it's a darn shame. That's why everybody picked them to win. At least I did. I thought they were the favorite to win the West. Because they, they finally have a quarterback. They're back to square one. But guess what? Week one, we sat here and, and uh, again, Jacob, uh, okay, they play Utah State. Yeah. You and I sat here, Weber. Yes. Utah State had nine tackles for losses, and Iowa ran for a little over 80 yards. And we both went, whoa, you know what I mean? This, this can't be. This is Utah State, Iowa. Well, guess what? 
Yeah. The last two weeks, 180 yards rushing, right. 200 yards rushing. Kirk Ferentz got it figured out. They know right now what they have to do to win their defense. I, Iowa administration, please understand, there was only – they had a – Van Ness went in the first round. Campbell went in the first round. Laporta went in the top of the second. He could have been a first-rounder. Nobody did that. Alabama and Ohio State had three first-round draft picks. Iowa had two plus Laporta. My point is it's not easy to replace first-round draft picks. Yeah. Some schools go an entire lifetime and don't have a first-round draft pick. So I, I, I know I'm going off a little bit on what a great job that I was done to get to this point, but I think it's factual because the players are playing that way. And, um, uh, yeah, I, look at, and they got a favorable schedule. Go ahead, Rev. Rob. No, I'm with you 100%. I mean, I, right? I, don't you like – I like the name their of schedule. The, game is, the name of the game is winning the game. And you know what? I mean, however you do – like the punter – Tory Taylor was unbelievable this weekend. And if that's I forgot him. To do, if that's what you need yeah. to do to win, I mean, this is a team that has far more punting yards than it has yards of total offense, and yet this is their formula. And you know what? Their formula works. And it, that, it, it doesn't always have to be aesthetically the most pleasing. All you care about is, is do you win? And as you talk about, not only are they down their starting quarterback – their two best weapons were their tight ends, and those guys are, are hurt now. Thank too. you. Now, I know you've written 100 books. Let me, I'm going to ask one. you a question. Yeah. Reggie Roby. You know who Reggie of Roby is? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Kirk Ferentz referenced him in, his, in the post game talk. This, Great this kid right here, this punter they got right now, is he's breaking all Reggie Roby's records. He's fabulous. He's be playing a long time in the NFL. He's fabulous. You know, my book was centered around a punter. So I, I got I, your no, book. No, no one respects I'm punting more than through. I do. I'm a much-needed win for Illinois on Saturday. Went down to College Park, handed Maryland just its second loss in its last nine games. First conference win of the year for the Illini, who were expected to contend for the division crown this year. Do have a favorable schedule down the stretch, starting with a home game Saturday against a Wisconsin team they beat handily a season ago. Let's dive into all of that. Coach speak. Brett Bielema is joining us now. And, Coach, First of all, thanks for the time. It, it was interesting to watch you after the Nebraska game. I obviously know you quite well. And, and watching you in that news conference, it was obvious how frustrated you were. And you made it really clear. You basically said, we're going to get it fixed in whatever way we need to do, whatever we need to do personnel-wise, whatever we need to do scheme-wise, we're going to get this thing right. And then you turned around and backed it up and did it on Saturday. What was different? against Maryland than, than you had done the previous few weeks? You know, Dave, I think the, the season itself, you, you, every season is its own little time capsule, right? And you got to uh, figure out what your players are, what their strengths are. And, and you know, it, sometimes it takes a while. We had a lot of really good players returning, but lost some good players. We, we lost some great voices. And, you know, then, you know, six games into it, I think we kind of had an assessment. But case in point today, literally, I just walked off the practice field. We, we literally took offensive uh, – uh, third down short and fourth down and short and move that to Tuesday and practice it every day of the week. And, um, you know, that move in itself parlayed into this past Saturday. We had a third and one on our opening drive that we convert. Next play is a touchdown. We have a fourth and one at the end of the half that we convert, converts to a touchdown. Had a third and about two early in the third quarter that we convert, goes to a touchdown. And that was a huge effect in our game. So the old cliche, right, practice is what you do. Um it really played out for us this past week, for sure. You know, it's funny. You were bringing up that fourth down play on the goal line right before the half. And to me, that epitomized everything that was different, right? The line of scrimmage has really been a struggle this year. And when we were down in Champaign for your practice, I don't think we thought that was going to be the case. But you had had the fourth down, the third and the fourth down against Nebraska, where you didn't score on that opening drive right down at the goal line. And then you went for it with Fagan, fourth and one, on the two-yard line, and not only, as you said, not only did you convert the fourth down, you get the touchdown. To me, that was the play that said, hey, this is going to be different. Take me through the mentality of going for it rather than kicking the field goal and what that play meant to the game. Yeah, there was a couple things in play there. We uh, had, you know, it was obviously an end-of-half situation. We had a timeout. Uh, we actually had thrown a pass play right before that that was, uh, in, uh, you know, an incomplete pass, and we felt that if we didn't gain yardage, we didn't know if we were going to go for it, but... Um, the way it kind of played out, the analytics obviously said yes. I felt good about it. But when I asked my OC, Barry Lunny, what do you feel and what do you want to call? He said, I got it and I feel great, right? And uh, Caden Fagan, again, has been a really important part of our, our progress here the last couple of weeks. A big back. He's very tough. Everything he does, 
he falls forward, fun kid to be around. And I think all that kind of parlayed into that moment right there. But again, it was because of what we practiced. Zy Chrysler, our right guard, literally the first time he'd been with us for an entire week of practice, played his best game, uh, really felt up front. We were kind of controlling the line of scrimmage, and that's what parlayed us into that moment. Hey, Brent, uh, give you a little break on the X and O's, just from another angle that people were curious about. You know, your football team, you have done a fantastic job, and I got a grandson at Loyola uh, that you'll be recruiting in a couple years. But So I talked to all these <laughs> high school coaches, and they just rave about how your staff has, has attacked recruiting in high school. When, when you look at the transfer portal, some of these schools brought in 20, 25 guys. I'm talking about in the conference – and you brought in seven. How are you approaching the transfer portal in relationship to recruiting and staying, you know, with the high school commitment? Yeah, Coach, I appreciate the comment. And, and really, we have made a very conscientious effort to, to recruit the state of Illinois, uh, kind of like anybody, you know, in, in college football. Uh, most college teams are very uh, representative of the area they're around, right? Like even when you guys were rolling in Miami, I know you guys did – all you could to recruit those Miami and Florida kids to stay there. We've done the same thing here, uh, and and that's a big part of it. I've really kind of structured it. We use the uh, development phase of our program. We Every year you come in with a group of seniors that you know are going to graduate, right? Even the COVID year thing, you have X number of players, and we've used that to recruit high school players. And then the transitional players, guys that might leave your program early, guys that maybe enter in the portal, guys that leave early because they're playing really good football in the NFL calls them up. Those are the guys and the numbers that I set aside for free agency, kind of get guys that, that fit a position of need. Uh, for, we were really thin in the, in the back end at the safety position, so we took three safeties. Thank goodness we did. We lost our best player. The first play he was in the game this year, Matt Bailey, at boundary safety, and we've had a lot of guys fill in for that role. Um, lost a couple guys to the draft, two safeties uh, that got drafted that were a big part of our defense a year ago have been filled by, by uh, uh, guys that we brought on through the portal. So. I kind of balance it with numbers, but it really does get down to kind of the model of the NFL, right? You recruit, develop, and draft certain players, but you acquire free agent players for an immediate need, and that's what we've done. Now, now going back to Wisconsin, obviously we everyone knows the success that you had up there. Uh, you got to still have some ties. I mean, is there any type of uh, – boy, I know you'd love to go up there and beat them, no question. Uh Barry Alvarez, you're going to be running into Barry. You got anything going on, or is it just all uh, get up or get a victory and get out? I, I think, it, as you know, Coach, like you kind of <laughs> move through your career. And uh, I, I mentioned the day before the, 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 we got on camera here, right? It's about relationships. It's not about the play. I love my time at Wisconsin. I was there, you know, uh, you know, basically seven years of my life that was really a lot of fun. Great, great, uh, you know, nine years in total, built a lot of relationships. I know. Their AD McIntosh, I know obviously Luke from um, there, but it, it it really doesn't feel that way anymore. I think as long as I've been gone and the kids they've recruited, uh, but the relationship still exists. I watched the final drive the other night. And I see Dave sitting next to James White, who's a Wisconsin legend. I remember recruiting him out of St. Thomas Aquinas and watching his career, his life, his journey, and to see him now in the Big Ten Network. Even though he's a UW grad, I love that kid like like no other. And then Anthony Heron. I recruited back to Iowa, who's from Bolingbroke, Illinois, and his life, I've stayed connected to him literally just a year ago when he lost his father, reached out and had a moment with him that I remember being in at home. So it's, it is about the schools you're at, but it's about the relationships you build. And, uh, you know, I think in this world, uh, it's about those things that really matter in the, in the end, and that's kind of where I feel right now. Yeah. I love that he's watching the final drive, oh, right? Okay. I mean, that's, that's great. He, he needs expert input, uh, right? That's right. He's taking notes. He's not, he's not, he he's he's not yeah. hearing, yeah. Just hearing what well, you say. The guy that I would expect to be the best for us is Jay Lehman, you know, an Illinois grad, and he hammers us the most. So <laughs> we get, we get, we'll have to have a conversation there. But <laughs> he gave hey, Anthony a little heat. He was the most best dressed on stage by far. Hey, <laughs> hey, hey, Coach, I'll leave you with one real positive thought, okay? For, if you get through the Keys or get down to Florida, give me some advance notice, and I'll get get our guy Jimmy Johnson, and uh, I'll coordinate it, and we'll uh, we'll get on that boat and have a few a uh, few cold ones, okay? So right. I got to know in advance. So if I'm in Naples, we can get it worked out. I've been on that. Uh, I've been on the three <laughs> rings several times with Jimmy. Um, I know to show up with the right uh, with the right toll ticket to get in the in the on the boat, and he definitely knows his fish. And I know we'd love to have you an opportunity in the future. I appreciate it. Hey, Coach, give me the scouting report on Wisconsin. We talked about the significance of that game to you and maybe less so than 
you would have anticipated, or maybe less so than, than a couple of years ago. But still a huge game for you guys. I mean, I mentioned it. Like, hey, you, you still have a chance here to, if, if you rally down the stretch, to be a factor in the conference race. It's the first year with Luke Fickle. They are a, a different team schematically. How big a change is the, the scouting report against them? And, and then how big a factor is it without Tanner Mordecai? Dave, it's such a unique year in this league, right? Like, we've already had two divisional crossovers. Uh, we played Nebraska and Purdue, which were obviously new staff. So even though we played them in the last couple of years, it's a whole new uh, uh, preparation. And Wisconsin's no different. Um, there's still the elements of what they do. Obviously, some of the same players. But offensively, uh, what Longo's brought there is, you know, a little bit different from what they've done. But there is good carryover to some of the teams we've played already. Uh, I, I think offensively, you know, the fact that they're probably, you know, obviously transitioning with a new quarterback. Um, and they've had some injuries on, on, on both sides of the ball. But we're expecting to play a tough, physical, hard-fought game. Defensively, they uh, just got done with a physical game against Iowa. And to see that that play out the way it did, it's it's a tremendous task. We have them at our place. Last year, we were up there. This year, they're coming to our place. And, and to be able to have them at home, it's our homecoming game. So it means a lot to our fans, our community, our people. And really excited. Really, I, I have a lot of respect for Luke. Um, uh, I've known him a long time. Uh, as an assistant coach, we cross paths as a head coach, have some some common friends and associates in the business. So a lot of respect for him and the building and, and all that they bring it uh, as a Big Ten football program. Excited for Saturday to get here. Coach, the last thing I want to ask you is about your quarterback, Luke Altmeyer. Last year, we documented it quite a bit. Tommy DeVito took such good care of the ball. Luke's had some turnover issues here. And, and you said something that I thought was really telling at the end of that game because he really played well against Maryland. And, and you were saying – you know, sometimes the, the quarterback and the coach get too much praise if things go well and maybe too much blame if things go poorly. How have you kept Luke in it here despite some struggles holding on to the ball? Yeah, when I recruit quarterbacks, I tell them that all the time, especially to parents. Like, listen, I, I get, you know, I have a, ca a, a contract, a salary. They pay me well to take the heat, and I, I don't mind doing that every time, every day, right? Like, everybody's got all the answers. But as a coach, that's what we're prepared for. That's what we sign up for. I just think as a quarterback – you know, they're, they're, they're a college kid that's looking to find success, and sometimes the criticisms they get are too much. I thought Luke, since the Penn State game, has done a tremendous job of taking care of the football. Uh, there was one play on Saturday. It was an interception. It was actually a defensive B.I. that didn't get called the right way. And, and you know, on the sideline, I said, hey, we'll get that one back. We'll take care of you and move forward. That was the last intercept or the last turnover of the game, and our guys have really done a conscientious job the last two or three weeks of, of the things that were beating us early on, penalties, mental errors, and turnovers. We've kind of righted the ship there. Uh, we're playing some physicality. I'm really excited to see this group play on Saturday. Just had a really good Tuesday practice and really excited to get this one behind us, see what Wednesday brings. All right, Brett, really looking forward to the game. We appreciate you taking some time out. Talk with us straight off the practice field. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's dedication. And you used his quote, right? You used his quote in the final drive, right? Yeah, well, you know. Absolutely. I, I, I think we, now that we know that, that Brett's a final <laughs> drive watcher, right, where we might have to – you know, somehow uh, skew the conversation. I'm going to talk to Jay Lemon. I'm calling Jay. <laughs> Brett, I'm going to call. I'm going to call Jay for you. Don't worry. I'll take care. You can count on me and take care of that end. I appreciate it very much, gentlemen. ILL. All right, good stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. Great to talk to you. Every team in the Big Ten has played at least six games. The Big Ten leaders: Leah Tungabailoa, topping the conference in passing yards. Kyle Manungai leading in rushing yards. Marvin Harrison Jr. in receiving yards. Jay Higgins is second nationally in tackles, and Ricardo Hallman tied for second in the country in picks. The numbers are nice, but Wani goes beyond the numbers. They could be a guide, perhaps. Oh, yeah. But they're, they're not the final word when it comes to these midseason awards. So let's dive into a few of them. Let's start with the coach of the year. Who would you take well, as your midseason coach it, of the year? It's not Greg Schiano, so relax. Okay. okay. I know you were, you know, no, I'm going with. Uh, and I'll he, tell you he's what, in the conversation. He's in the conversation. Yeah. Mike Loxley, I mean, last week was a tough loss, and we had a great interview with him on the show. Uh, but my pick is James Franklin, and I'll tell you why. What they have done with a new quarterback, getting, we talked earlier, balanced offense, bringing in Manny Diaz, an ex-head coach, and, and letting him kind of coordinate the defense. i tell you, James Franklin has done a fabulous job in all areas of that football team. He's ultimately going to be judged by what happens this weekend and what happens in November against Michigan. But I agree with you. I mean, you look at to this point in the season – Man, they've done a nice job. And to do it, losing Sean Clifford, I thought he did such a nice job last year 
of setting them up for this year, getting Drew Aller, kind of dipping his toe in the water, putting yep. him in in various situations. He was clearly ready to go. So, yeah, it's – I, I, there, there are a lot of candidates. I think, you know, Jim Harbaugh obviously missed three games, but, man, they're, right. they're clicking on all cylinders. I think you can make an argue, argument for Kirk Ferentz, given everything that they have, they have been through and all of kind of the negativity heading into the year surrounding the offense. But, but James Franklin's done a really good job. How about Offensive Player of the Year? You, you know, Offensive Player of the Year, uh, the numbers, yes, but I gave him the award because of more than just his performance. I'm, I'm going with Blake Corum, Mm. Running back from Michigan, 12 touch, rushing touchdowns, right. leading the country in, right. with 12 rushing touchdowns. But, and he's only played, you know, because they have such big leads and they're trying to rotate backs, he doesn't get the number of carries and opportunities. So for him to have those numbers at this point in the season uh, with, with somewhat limited work, uh, is outstanding. But the real reason is, you know, I remember the first game or two of the season, he's sitting up there at the press conference and, and Jim Har Coach Harbaugh wasn't there. And they didn't, he didn't have a big day. And, you know, J.J. Right. threw for all the touchdowns. And he says, hey, we're only concerned about winning. And I, eh, I took a closer look. And then last week, when Donovan Edwards scores that touchdown right. and he's the happiest guy in the stadium, that says that's this kid. This guy's a special guy. He's uh, he, he's my midway award winner. So I mean, because I think you would make an argument, right? That J.J. McCarthy's had a phenomenal year, and everything goes through the quarterback. But you're saying, I mean, Blake Corum has had a really, you know, as you mentioned, the, the touchdowns and whatnot. But you're saying it's more than just I think so statistical. It's 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 leadership. Yep, and for yeah. the and, and and not having and J.J. is a great leader. Not too, having as yeah. many opportunities yep, to absolutely. do something. Okay. Uh, what about the player of the year on the defense? You side? know what? I'm, go I'm going with Jay Higgins from okay. Iowa. And this is, you know, I mean, he has taken, you know, Jack Campbell, my guy, Jack Campbell. Yes. I gave him every award we could on defense <laughs> last year. Uh, he's not doing bad for the Detroit. Number right. first place Detroit Lions, by the way. But, you know, he, the, the guy is leading in tackles by 20 total tackles, you know, and so the guy's making a lot of plays. He's caused fumbles. He's got an interception, uh, and he's leading one of the top defenses, obviously, in, in not just the conference, but in the country. So he would be my guy, and I'll tell you, the one that I wanted to, Cooper DeGene. Yeah. I love this guy. He was one of my preseason picks for defensive back, you know, the best players coming into the season, and this guy just doesn't get as many opportunities. But he does, obviously, with special teams. Uh, he's a leader. You know, I don't know who, if, who Kurt Ferentz would say, but in my mind, when I watch this kid play and his mannerism, Cooper DeGene, leader, he's leads that defense. And he was the preseason defensive player of the year in yep. the conference. You mentioned leading the Big Ten in punt return average as well. So he impacts so many aspects of the game. Uh, let's finish off with this, the freshman of the year to this point. You know what? Beginning of the year, they were struggling a little bit, and, it, and we talked about P.J. Fleck, Minnesota. This is not their DNA. Well, guess what? Darius Taylor, he's the next back now that they finally figured it out. Freshman, I mean, the guy's 133 yards per game, you know, averaging, uh, you know, fourth in the Big Ten in rushing, and he missed, what, three games early in the year? Oh, well, he's missed, yeah, he's missed two, the last two games. And, so uh, hopefully they get him back yeah, Three games total, yeah, three yeah. games total. Right. So he would be my my freshman of the year just because, hey, he's, he's earned it, and I think he's just going to get better. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I mean, obviously the, the issue is, is he healthy? But, man, when he's healthy, he's been unbelievable. Because you talk about that average, but that includes a game where he only had one carry. Exactly. So, I mean, the three games where he was their featured back, he was – Incredible. Dylan Thieneman's been great, too, for, yep. for Purdue, one of the leading tacklers on, on their defense and has had a, a huge impact for them. It is time for Wani's winner of the week. Six to choose from in the Big Ten. Who got the nod? The Iowa Hawkeyes got the nod. I mean, you know, you go on the road to Wisconsin, uh, and the coaching staff, I thought, did a fabulous job in all phases of making adjustments. Uh, we talk about, uh, hey, you know, beginning of the year, struggling running the ball. Now they run for 200 yards, okay? They hold on to it. They protect the quarterback, do what they have to do passing-wise, and special teams. Nobody puts more of an emphasis on special teams than Kurt Ferentz. Uh, 
just a great team win. Fantastic. And now they are set up to make a, a legitimate run to win the West. Yeah, absolutely. No, the schedule is favorable. No yep. question about it. Starts with Minnesota this week, a team that they have beat eight straight times. That's their longest winning streak in the history of that rivalry. This was fun. We'll see you next week. Yes, absolutely. All right. Uh, got uh, Anthony Heron and Pat Forty coming here tomorrow. We'll see you then.